Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. How are we all this afternoon? Um, there's competition with the spring weather. I think it's really great that you uh, made it here this afternoon for this conversation on, on International Women's Day. And um, it doesn't get much better than this. Indeed, spring is on its way. The sun is shining. It's Friday. I'm feeling good. Happy International Women's Day, everybody. Um, my name is Victoria Iverson. I work in the office of the president of ETH Zurich, and it's my pleasure to uh, moderate our event here today. And this event really is a celebration of all the women in our community. Um, and having said that, can I just acknowledge the fact that we're not just women in the room here this afternoon. It really is ladies and gentlemen, and I think that is a very important point when I think about International Women's Day. Um, it's a reminder of the work that's been done and the work that remains to be done on advancing women's issues, and specifically that it's only together that we can really advance equality, change the equation, and close the gender gap. So I thank you for the diversity and inclusion that you are all representing uh, here today in our audience. This event is part of a series which we call the Global Lecture Series. Whose um, first time is it attending a, a global lecture at ETH? Oh, wow, quite, quite a few. Okay, well, welcome to all of you that are new. Uh, welcome back uh, to those of you who've been here before. Um, let me say a few words then about um, the series so you, you have a little bit of the context. Um, the idea is to offer a platform where we bring remarkable people together to discuss their personal insights, interests, and experiences, um, and share their expertise on contemporary topics. And um, in addition to simply satisfying a curiosity to learn, what we really hope that you get out of our session today is um, expanding your perspectives uh, and broadening your thinking, and perhaps challenging some of the opinions that we have so that we can make a meaningful impact on society. So here's how we'll be spending the next hour together. Um, I will invite our guest speakers to join me on the stage, and we'll have a dialogue to get warmed up before um, I'll come to you so that we have a very interactive conversation. So please, as, as the speakers are uh, exchanging with me, uh, in the beginning of the session, make a note of any questions you have, and I promise we have enough time to get to them later on. Uh, this session is recorded and will be published online in the days to follow. So I think that's all the housekeeping out of the way. Yes, I'm giving uh, I'm given a thumbs up. That's always a good sign. Um, let's get our celebration underway with three incredible women speakers who are here to share their perspectives on empowering change. And first, I'd like to introduce Catherine Amaker. Catherine is a multiple board member. After 30 years of operational management roles at Novartis, Swisscom, and SBB, she has and still is politically active and um, is the proud mom of three kids. Welcome, Catherine, please. Join me on stage. So, Catherine, um, at the moment, I understand you're board president of Fairtrade Max Havlar Switzerland and member of the chairs group of Fairtrade International. Um, what does empowering change mean to you personally, and perhaps can you give us an example of how you really lift this in the work that you do today in the context of fair trade? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to be here, and thank you also for the audience um, to be interested in, in these um, topics. Um, well, empowering change. Change is, is a great thing, but it needs a lot of energy, 
to, uh, to really make it happen. It needs energy, it needs people, it needs courage. Why is that so? And it takes a lot of time. And I do think it's... You, you mentioned that I'm a mom, yes. And um, I do think when a child is born, it takes about one hour and this child starts to copy. Mm -hmm. And a child copies normally the parents or the people around. And why? It's quite a clever strategy. Because the parents that are here have at least survived for one generation. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. So copying is a good survival plan. What does that mean for empowering change? It means that you have to, let's say, really give energy into a transformation because it doesn't happen just by, by natural. And um, I brought a little example, as you, as you mentioned, my, um, my board work at, at Fairtrade, um, an example of a woman. Um, yes, this is the, the picture of, of her. Um, her name is Lucy. She is a smallholder cocoa farmer in Western Africa, producing mainly for the European market. And in this world of Lucy, there is this, um, you have this nice um, yeah, SDG <laughs> round here. So the sustainable development goal number one is no poverty. And Lucy lives in a world where this no poverty is at risk. There is data around that about 85% of all families or farm holders don't get um, an, a living wage income. And of course, then their child uh, labor is, 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 around, is around the corner. And Lucy lives also in an environment where women do not have equal rights. They do not have, um, at a broad extent, they're not involved in the decision-making processes. They are also exposed, maybe more than here, to, to violation. And uh, in, this, in this area, Lucy decided to make her farm um, fair trade certified. Mm -hmm. um, that means to get a minimum income for her yield, but it also means, and that's most important for today, it means that she can profit from some equal rights initiatives. And she did that. So, for example, she could attend leadership courses, especially for, for women. She got access to, to money, which mm -hmm. is a big topic in, in her area. Money is men's, men's work. And, um, but on the field, in the agricultural production, there are more women than, than men. And she um, reached to be selected or, or nominated to a board of her cooperative, a local cooperative, which is normally not the case. From that board work, she started to do training for others, men and women, for new or, let's say, climate positive um, agricultural techniques. And in the end, she also set up her own pension plan when she is retired. So um, that's, that's a very positive change um, for, for her. And, um, is she relevant on a global scale? This is just one story, this is one person. Yes, I think, because when we look at some uh, UN estimates on what would it mean to have a world with equal rights globally for each and every one, and this is an impressive number. The number is that when this would have been the case, about 150 million people on that planet would not be um, malnourished people. And I think that's quite an impact that's worth to go this extra energy, this extra, this extra mile to make a change happen. Change needs for some people to be very, to, to have the courage to go beyond the limits or the limitations of a social context. And it's also needed that there are people around that support that change, that they support the people who want to go over the limit. And there's also a third role that can help is um, just to be silent and let the change happen and don't fight, don't fight against it. Interesting. Um, 
I think I can sum that up as um, the importance of role models. And I think we'll be coming throughout this conversation back to that notion, and I have a particular question in mind for you, which I'll hold for now, um, because it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, um, Mena El Asadi. Um, Mena is Assistant Professor at the Department of Computer Science of ETH Zurich. She leads the Interactive Visualization and Intelligence Augmentation Lab. Yes, I got that in. I had to practice that a lot, let me tell you. Uh, her main research interest is studying interactive human AI collaboration interfaces, and she's interested in empowering humans by teaming them up with AI agents in co adaptive processes. Welcome, Mena, to the stage. I'm really interested. <laughs> I'm, I'm really interested in finding out exactly what that means. Um, and in your case, empowerment is actually very much part of your work and your research. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that and by extension explain what it is you do in your lab? Yeah, thank you and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so in my lab, we uh, try to design um, interfaces to collaborate between humans and AIs. And um, we always ask ourselves the question, how do we bring humans in the loop of an interactive system and how do we team them with AI so that we can be more effective when we uh, do uh, make decisions, but also when we solve different problems. And one of the main things that relates to also being here in an International Women's Day is trying to maybe detect different biases. So some of the people we team up with are, for example, linguists, who are trying to check language models, like ChatGPT, you've probably all experienced that these days, and try to figure out, with these types of models, um, what are the representations, for example, of women? in these data? What are the representations that these models have learned about our reality, about our current um, system and society and so on? So I wanted to briefly show you something because my lab is about visualization, so I need to show it. And I will show you a little bit what it means to ask a model to divide up specific attributes based on personal pronouns, male and female. Okay. And if you look here, that's kind of the decision-making of a model telling us that it has learned that women are blonde receptionists and housekeepers and men are strong football players and other characteristics, obviously. And then we can go through the different parts of the model and try to figure out like, how exactly did it learn that and like, what are the patterns in this data and so on and so forth. So we can actually look at the internal data of these models. We can even go a step further and ask the model to show us its decision-making path. So, for example, if we ask it to describe a specific uh, decision and we just replace the query that we are entering with typical male or female names, what would come out? And this is not just for gender, but um, I will show you one example that includes gender. So we're just asking after someone finishes their degree, they want to become X. And the model should continue the sentence. Mm -hmm. So you will see that women want to become actors and nurses, and um, men want to become, what was it, doctors and lawyers. <laughs> and you can do that segmentation on any part of our um, demographic. It doesn't have to be gender, it doesn't have to be these names, it doesn't have to be two characteristics. You can enter any type of descriptive or uh, name here. Um, and the question here is like, do we want to trust that? And what I want to come to is the lack of trust in these models is not just about us computer scientists not being able to create better models, but if we actually look at the US census data, for example, here, and these are just like the job distributions um, in the US, and that's a um, project from a couple of students in, in my course a couple of years ago. And they're just looking at like how many more men are engineers or like how many more, nurse, nurse, um, how many more women are nurses and secretaries. And then they try to compare that to asking the model to basically continue a sentence. So he or she is a doctor, what is more likely? And then they just mapped that distribution. And my question to all of you is, what do we actually want these models to learn and represent? Do we want them to learn and represent the reality of our world, which is not equitable? Or do we want them to represent something more idealistic? Mm -hmm. So here is the, re the real world distribution, and this is what the models have learned. 
And this is like something like nurse, engineer, dietitian, and so on and so forth. And I think we need to come together as a society and try to think about what do we actually want these techniques to learn, especially that they're becoming more and more prominent in our day-to-day -day life. So for me, empowerment is through creating these communication interfaces to allowing people to actually look into AI systems and to see how they make changes and to basically input their human feedback to tell us about the world they want to create. Because I really think that bringing humans and AIs together can lead us to solve more complex problems, but also to create a better world. So if you want to know more, there's a lot more interactive demos. But um, yeah, happy to talk about the role of technology here. Oh, and we will, and I bet there'll be a lot of questions around that. Thanks a lot, Mena. And um, finally, our third speaker this evening is Marie-Claire Graf. Marie-Claire is a climate justice activist, co-founder of the Youth Negotiators Academy, and former youth representative at the United Nations Climate Change and Food Systems Summit. She focuses on training young diplomats globally, and her background includes studies and work at ETH Zurich and the University of Zurich. Welcome, Marie-Claire. Please join us on the stage. Marie-Claire, tell us a little bit. How do you interpret our theme today of empowering change in the context of the work that you do, um, with reference perhaps to some of the actors, uh, institutions, and organizations uh, that you deal with? And uh, I think it's particularly interesting in your case that you're really looking at um, the local, the national, and the international level and the interplay between all of those. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and um, talk about this really important topic. And maybe I'm just following up on what you, Catherine, mentioned about the decision making, but also it goes into the, what you mentioned about the bias, right? Because how are decisions currently taken and actually who is taking these decisions? And so back then when I was actually studying at ETH, I was selected or I was appointed to be the youngest ever negotiator for the government of Switzerland to the multilateral climate negotiations. You probably all heard of these uh, COP conferences happening always by the end of the year. And so I was appointed directly by the back then President Simonetta Somaruga to be part of the delegation at the age of, of 23. And so why I'm mentioning this is because it's it's really kind of like paying forward on how we kind of create more inclusive delegations. And so I was part of the delegation and it was, it was an honor, but it was really, really challenging. But what I then did is, is what you mentioned. I have been co-founding an academy to support young females specifically from all around the world to be part of decision-making structures. Why? Because I think it's absolutely crucial when we talk about empowering change that we are not only the recipients of decisions which are taken by others who do not live the reality we live, but actually we're the ones who sit at these negotiation tables, the ones who actually, you know, have the right to, to veto a decision or actually like, you know, go into these negotiations because they talk from the place where they actually have an understanding of what it means. And unfortunately, in many decision-making structures, I mean, the Swiss parliament is also not that much better. I mean, it's getting better. You can talk about this, about the history, but on, on the multilateral level, um, there's like around one third of, of females in the delegation teams. But when you actually look in what power they have and who is actually then talking these tables and actually who is taking the final decisions, it's even worse. So we need representation, which is definitely crucial. That's why we, um, why we support young women. But also, I think it's more also about giving the recognition and also like putting the resources in place to actually have females who are effectively and meaningfully engaged in these processes. Because it's easy to just have like a delegation 50-50. You can always make it. Mm. But we need them to actually understand what's going on. And whoever engaged in politics and especially multilateral decision making knows how complicated and complex it can be, and also how very often it's not intuitive for females, you know, you go up there and aggressively fight because we see this a very lot. So the female leadership is very much under pressure. And I think that's also part of the problem why we're actually not getting where we have to be. Um, but also like really recognizing the diversity um, in these spaces and that there are different approaches to solving these um, topics. And then maybe the last point around the resources. Yeah. I think it's really important that we empower um, through capacity building, through community building, these young people who then go into these spaces. So once they're actually there, they're not just following the ones who not do it maybe the right way or like doing it on a very exclusionary base, um, but actually come in with a new style of leadership um, with this collective and very much also like, you know, female leadership type. Um, so that's what we are doing at the Youth Negotiators Academy. And also that's what that would summarize empowering change, looking into representation, recognition, as well as providing the adequate resources to actually um, make this change effective and meaningful. Yeah. 
there's some keywords that are starting to, to come up over and over again. Trust and representation and bias and uh, having role models that uh, one can look up to. Um, and I also get a sense that um, none of this is really easy, is it? Um, what are some of the, the challenges that you've come across in your work and in your research with, with really, you know, actually having the change, making the change happen? Why don't we start with you, Catherine? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> I'm a natural scientist, I believe in numbers, and I believe in that sense what Marie Claire said in representation. Mm -hmm. So give the chance to, to people to, let's say, to, to, to enter a board or to, um, to, to get the chance to lead a project. Yeah. And of course, they will not be super perfect in the beginning, but this doesn't matter. I believe very much in this becoming. So it's not this big bang and then you are on a corporate board or, or what, whatever, or you are leading the ETH. So it's a becoming. And my personal, let's say, story is also that I would have never thought where I would end up when I think back 30 years. But I remember that when I was recruited to my very first job, there was a, a guy who was uh, the member of the executive board of Zibagaig, and it was the last formal, let's say, hello for 30 minutes um, to, to give the final okay that it's good to recruit me. And after the 30 minutes, he said, um, well, I have no, no um, doubts about um, you will make your way here at, at Zibagaig. And I was 28, I left the room, and I thought, how can he say that? How can he say that? He doesn't know me. Well, what is that? And then I realized this is credit. You give credit and then you can grow. Or you give trust and then you can, you can become something. And it's also working the other way around. When there is no trust, you cannot perform. You realize that. So, so I th I really, I'm really a fan of, let's say, um, um, g giving that trust and you can fail also, and then you give, you give once again trust. And to give trust, what does it mean in a, let's say, in a, in a business world, or maybe also in sports or in academia, I, I don't know. But it's, um, each and everyone can do that. Mm. When you have a meeting, in which eyes do you look? When you speak, to whom do you refer? When you refer and say, I make an example, um, I build on what Janine said. She sits there and we were on the same executive board for quite some time. When you do that, it makes something with the hierarchy in, in, in this group. Mm -hmm. And when you never look at someone and you never refer to and you refer to others, then it's very clear who, who is where in the hierarchy. And I think that's something, it goes to what you say, when you, when you have more junior people in, around the table, yeah. when, when, you, when, you tell, when you tell them names, um, then, then they, can, they can grow before they say something. Yeah. They get self-confidence. Self I remember a very bad example when I entered the, the board of the University of Basel. There, are no, there is no media here, right? So I can, nope, I can nope. say that. <laughs> um, I, was, I was talking um, also at the first meeting there, and then I said I referred to something uh, that Sibyl said. And after that meeting, Sibyl came to, to me and she said, I'm here now on that board for more than 10 years. Never, ever, never someone called my name. Thank you. And I was, I mean, I was flat. I, did, I didn't know that story. Yeah. So this is so powerful and everyone, every one of you can do that. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. I think the, the observation is there is, is one that I've been... Um, I've been thinking about in the run-up to this conversation, and, and it's about how you make International Women's Day actually every day. It's not just that we have to um, do this once a year and uh, remind ourselves that uh, these issues are out there, but uh, how can we build it into our everyday lives? And perhaps, um, how do we build it into our lives as global citizens? What, what actually can we do uh, on our level to impact some of these change? I'm coming to you, Mahikla. Uh, Maybe we have some, uh, something to learn from, from the youth. Well, I don't think it's exclusively to young people, so I think everyone <laughs> should step up. But 
it's like, what goes in line to, to what, what you mentioned, because change is hard, especially systemic change, because you go against a specific hierarchy and specific people who benefited from it, right? That's why a system is in place. So in my place, international decision-making, we have lots of people and countries who benefit from a system of oppression that, you know, the smaller island states, for example, are very affected by the climate crisis. When we look from a climate justice perspective, the ones who have not been emitting a lot, but ultimately are the ones who deal with the consequences and with loss and damage, are not talking a lot, they don't have resources, they have very small delegations, they're not really benefiting, right? And I think like, it's really this system, this hierarchy you also mentioned, which we need to break. And, I've, and I've, every one of us lives in certain hierarchies. And I think like what we can really do every day is reminding ourselves who is not in the room, who is not talking, who doesn't get the word, who is not listened to, who doesn't get the recognition. And as you mentioned, like point these people out, empowering them, supporting them, be a mentor to them. And it can be so powerful, you know, in these spaces. As mentioned, I was a negotiator. I mean, I was not particularly very successful. I was like there for I was, was there for one year. And then what I did, I created a movement, a movement, an academy to really support more and more young people. And I think it's really on us to see where these challenges, where is this underrepresentation happening, and then build something which is long lasting. And I think ideally has a movement character because I do think that to drive change, we need movements of different actors coming together, thinking an ecosystem approach where all, all of these different actors coming together to support, but driven by the underlying effort to have a systemic change. Because if we just you know, have a little bit more women somewhere, but the system itself doesn't recognize that we have to have different leadership, the system is just gonna honestly abuse the women to basically just come complicit in the same leadership style and it's not gonna achieve the systemic change we need. Um, so I think that's something we all can do in our own you know, workspace. Um, and I think it really starts first with the recognition, but then really teaming up and bringing the different actors together to create these movements and then really recognizing what is missing and, and really empowering um, this. And uh, it has been working so far quite good because we actually got feedback, you know, that all these young people in the rooms, they start to ask uncomfortable questions like, yeah, exactly, that's the point because we need uncomfortable questions mm. if we want to change the system. Mm. So, Mena, I'm coming to you now. You, you've seen the data, you work with the data every day, you've observed these biases. What's, what's the demand in actually doing something about the biases and how do you go about doing that? Because that sounds very complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is very complicated also because it's not just a technical issue. Right. It is a societal issue. It is an issue that does not just require a couple of computer scientists to sit together and like just get a better algorithm or produce better data. We really need to come together as society and as re representatives of different types of groups and as like representatives of different demographics and just really figure out what do we want to have? How do we want to envision our future? Um, and I think like we can build a lot of things uh, mm -hmm. based on whatever data we have, but I think we need to really, really think deeper and think about um, what, what are we kind of going forward to given the current state of technology and where do we want to maybe input our own um, requirements for change or our own desires or our own kind of feedback to these types of systems. So in... One answer to that question is, for me, to build systems where people, regardless of their background, can express their feedback to these types of AI models and really have impact. And one of the most decisive moments for me to actually pursue this career further was um, I was doing a study at a company in Toronto and um, I came in with all of my AI stuff and I was like talking about parameters and like model this and like features that and, and then I realized in that moment, I'm talking to people who actually dropped out of high school, they were doing like uh, forum moderation and stuff like that. Okay. And that was really scary. Like just talking that language was really off-putting to people. So they really didn't want to do the study. So then I started talking about minions and magic boxes and like all sorts of things. And um, kind of in, that, in the spur of the moment, did the study using the visuals and using the interactions, but just kept talking about minions. And afterwards, I analyzed the data, and the refinement that they did to the model was on par with something that a machine learning PhD did, who knew a lot about this model. And that was, for me, a moment where I realized, with the right metaphors, with the right interfaces, with the right actions, you can empower anyone to take control and to steer these things. So I think we really need to think about um, how we enable people to actually express themselves, how we enable them to participate, and how do we enable people who might not be the majority in whatever data to also be equitably treated 
um, in the decision making, which is not something that is kind of easily done specifically in these types of models. So I think there's a lot of challenges. There is a lot of optimism also to kind of develop solutions for them. But fundamentally, it requires all of us from all of our backgrounds to come together. And I personally really believe that every single person, regardless of what they've studied, how, who, what they've done in their life, has something to contribute to this conversation, just yeah. because of their life experience. Yeah, indeed. Um, thank you, Mena. And now it's your time to contribute to the conversation. Um, I hope that you've been taking notes furiously and have lots of questions for our audience. Uh, the way this is going to work is uh, in, I, I, it's like an, on an airplane. Uh, the seat in front of you has a microphone. <laughs> you press the green button, and when the red light is on, you may speak. Um, that's how that's going to work. Um, who wants to uh, ask our first question to our distinguished panel this afternoon? Don't be shy. Otherwise, I have lots of questions, but it would be great to make this as interactive as possible. We have a very diverse group of people on stage. No? Ah, I thank you very much. Go ahead. Oh, oh. I have a question for Mene. And please tell us who you are. I'm Irene, and I study computer science in the master here at ETH. Great. And the question is, like the graphs you were showing earlier, um, does the AI model actually sometimes make the bias even worse? Like I didn't quite catch it because it was shown for a short time, but I saw that like sometimes the percentage was even lower. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, some of the outcomes of these papers is trying to compare um, so-called adapter models that are, are trained to basically change uh, the actual um, like underlying language model to de-bias it. So we know statistically that they've done something and it looks like it's better, but when we actually look into the details, sometimes they just kind of shifted the entire distribution towards male pronouns. So it doesn't always happen that a statistical summary actually produces um, internally the outcomes that we're looking for. And the problem is not just be, uh, like based on binary gender. You can get any attribute and try to make it represented. And it, it's, it's just a mere data uh, problem uh, because we're trying to kind of discriminate between, between these patterns. So I think, like, yes, we, we would make it worse. But my question always comes back to, like, what do we want these things to represent if our real data in the real world is biased? Um, not just in terms of gender, but like imagine uh, the number of people in a wheelchair represented in a specific decision-making scenario. They are not as equally represented as people without a wheelchair. So I think like there's a lot of different demographic representation issues that we have to deal with. And at ETH there are lots of projects on that, but we're still far away from solving all of these issues. There was another question. It was, oh, go ahead. Hi. Hi, my name is Esther. I used to study here at ATL Zurich in architecture. Um, I also have a question for Mena. Um, I heard when, when um, models are trained uh, on, on um, graphics, um, it's cheaper to train them with people in low-income countries, and that actually more precise models would be much more expensive. Can you? Explain a little bit from your perspective, because that was kind of a restaurant at a beer conversation, and maybe you, um, your perspective is far more. Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. I think like the question is in general about data availability. And data availability is a big issue when you're training these models to be used around the world. Um, actually, what I have seen more in, in studies is that um, most of our image-based models, for example, are trained on internet-available data and usually English-speaking data, and it's very US-centric and Western-centric, and it's actually less usable for other countries that might not uh, uh, it, it is not represented in that bubble. So um, having representative data is essential to actually having these models applied in different contexts. Um, I'm not sure about the cost factor, um, like what, what that refers to, but I think like data availability is a crucial issue to have representative models and outcomes in the end. And definitely the current system does not enable uh, data availability to be as equitable. Uh, not just across different countries, but also across demographic um, uh, kind of representation. So 
imagine you're very affluent, you can go to the best hospital that like, uses the latest models, then data is produced about your case, and then this is fed back into the model, and then the model trains on your kind of demographic, and then all of a sudden we have a biased model that just amplifies biases because um, it is kind of ingrained in a system like that. Uh, so this is a big issue, uh, but, but I'm not sure about like, the cost factor. We can take that offline maybe. Yeah. I don't know if, if Catherine, do you want to comment on that? Because I think it also relates a little bit to um, some of the work that you might be doing um, in the context of fair trade. Well, I'm not a data scientist, to be, to be honest, and uh, the data topics that we have goes mainly along the global supply chain mm -hmm. to the smallholder producers, mm -hmm. and there it's uh, quite, quite difficult um, when you have a, a, a big corporation who's producing something, that's easy. But when you go to all the smallholders that form these cooperatives, it gets a little bit more tricky to, to do that. And another factor is, is the costs. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the legislation that is coming more and more on a European scale, and then it goes down, of course, in, in, into Switzerland and, and uh, all the countries here, and you have, you have to report that. Yeah, uh, uh, and it's a legal requirement. It's not nice to do that. It's a legal requirement. Yeah. Uh, then, it, then uh, um, it's yeah, it's it, it's really not so easy to to trace all the products. I yeah. mean, when you have a little bit of sugar in a product, you cannot say where this is coming from. When you have a banana, that's easy. When you have gold, like we have from twelve, let's say, mines from Peru, uh, that's easy because twelve, so you can handle that. Mm -hmm. But it, when it goes in into million or it goes over over continents in on the southern part of the globe and then it's always the cost question who is paying that yeah. and what we see and what where we struggle is when uh, big multinationals or or western uh, companies say yeah that's a good thing we do that and uh, the producer at the very beginning of the chain shall do that yeah and is responsible for and shall pay it this, uh, and this question is still open, yeah. who is doing that, who is paying that. And, and it goes a little bit to what exactly. you said, um, the systems, the, the, the business systems are done. So you, do, you don't want to change something. And when you have to, yeah, you, you want to be responsible on your report. But when you're re responsible with your money, that's another story. That's right. And um, you talked about bringing all the actors around the table and making sure that the people who are not in the room are heard. and. How, how do you make empowering change equitable? Can everyone afford to, to do this? And um, what, what do we do in the case when they don't? Well, I can refer to the system I work in and I mean, maybe like apply. I think it's what it takes is like the courage in the beginning to stand up and like really put it on the table. That's not fair that we don't have any young person in the room who actually has a decision-making power. It's nice to have them on the stage, you know, in the beginning and the end to make give some remarks. Mm. But what we want is actually to have them in the process specifically where they actually like have to seat at the table, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously like really bringing ensuring that, as mentioned, that they're not just there and then they kind of just listen because they're overwhelmed, but actually having the soft skills and having also the knowledge to actually make these contributions. And I think that's really crucial like whenever, like wherever we work and um, that we actually really support someone to be set up for success and not just be there for the sole purpose of representation. Yes. Because sometimes what we see is like, oh, now we need, you know, like more diversity. And it goes in line with like, you know, people with special abilities and disabilities, it goes of people of color, it goes in like, you know, women. There's so many different factors and we just try to be more diverse. And while trying to be more diverse, we kind of miss out why we actually want to be more diverse. Yeah. <laughs> because we actually believe that we make better decisions if we have a diverse representation. Right. And this requires a whole lot of underlying factors, and especially in a system which hasn't been in favor of women and many other groups around the world. And we just then bring in people, and we just believe, okay, now we have more diverse people, now it's going to be more representative, and it's going to be better. That's not true. We have to unlearn a lot of different patterns which we have mm -hmm. been put in place. For example, in the negotiations, um, very often it's a very aggressive tone, you know, and how these negotiations are happening. Okay. Well, a lot of women, including myself, don't feel very comfortable being very aggressive, you know, but rather have another style of negotiating. And there's so many different styles of negotiations, um, but we don't really allow this, for example, a more emotional, a more, a more personal touch, which I think is really crucial when we talk about a topic such as climate disasters, yeah. because ultimately it matters to the people and to their lives on the grounds. Yeah. And 
there's so many different factors which I think we have to really be very conscious and like not only learn but also unlearn, let things go to make space for new ones and be really attentive to the ones who come in new yeah. um, to, to listen and, and ourselves not be stuck that we actually become disempowering of change because we believe we know it better. Mm. Here, here. Good. Um, oh, I see another hand raised over there. You have the floor. Thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. I have also a um, question. Um, what type of changes uh, we are waiting now mm. and in future um, in, the, in a way to the next stage of digitalization with artificial intelligence and with metaverse? And how can we prepare ourselves just now for this future? Thank you. Thank you. AI clearly is the topic du jour. Um, Mena, you're <laughs> up again. <laughs> yeah, um, and I, I think like AI um, is driving a lot of people to think about possible futures, right? And, like um, yesterday, I was talking to some people about their mental model about AI. Like, what do you think is an AI? Like, how do you think you will be interacting with an AI in the future, and so on? And I think like having some sort of understanding of what you want this thing to become helps empower change in the sense that we can create that thing in the way you envisioned it to be. So there is this future where big tech will kind of give us thing and says, here is AI, deal with it. Yeah. And there is a future where you can give us a lot of different visions about futures you think might be a very positive outcome for you as an individual or for your group or whatever it is and tell us like this is what we want to make and let's work on making this happen. So, and I think like this is a way to maybe approach that in a more positivist and also empowering perspective, uh, which I think like at least here research and like um, the community um, around ETH, the AI center, like all of these different initiatives are trying to make happen. How do we get all of our visions about possible futures um, into systems and into realities. And, and I think like this is something where uh, we need to rethink this model. You don't need to adapt to a system that is given, but the system should cater to you. That's the way I would define human-centered computing and the way I teach it a day in, day out. Hi, Nicoletta. Hello, everybody. I'm Nicoletta, and I'm a member of the Circle. I used to study here at the ETH. And, well, thank you very much for this excellent discussion. I want to take us back a little bit to, to the numbers and a question to all of you. So today, I was a bit conflicted myself. Okay. Um, should I celebrate? Should I mourn? You know? <laughs> Have, being a chemist and having been in the chemical industry for 30 years, maybe some of you can relate to that. And so I, I looked at an article by The Economist that was about, it's called the Female Glass Ceiling Index. It was about the OECD countries, and um, it described the progress as glacial, glacial progress. Ooh. So um, how outraged are we, or how optimistic are we in terms of where we are today, or where we can go in the near future? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Not in 30 years, in the near future. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's really the main question. And just as a side note, yeah. Switzerland figured right at the bottom of this list of the OECD countries. So I think it was third or fourth large, uh, last on the list, just before Japan and Turkey and South Korea. So I think uh, we have some work to do here in Switzerland, mm -hmm. but I would like to hear how optimistic are you or how outraged are you today? That's a very good segue actually to one of my next questions. Thank you, Nicoletta. Um, because on International Women's Day, we like to have a sense of optimism. I, I don't want to be mournful today. Um, but really, is, is this keeping you up at night? Are, are we going in the right direction? Are you, how optimistic are you about this whole um, topic? Let's start with you, Catherine. Yeah, thank you for this question. I'm quite optimistic for, for Switzerland, but you're absolutely right. We are in the back of the, <laughs> of the, of the list. But um, I see some changes. 
Um, and it's interesting to, um, let's say, to analyze a little bit what triggered that change. We, we were, let's say, when we looked in, in economy on board positions or executive board positions, then we got really, really stuck over, <laughs> let's say, decades with about numbers like 13% or 14 or blah, blah, blah. Right now, we are on boards with 34 Mm -hmm. 34%. Two years ago, we were flat with around 20%, something like that. Mm -hmm. And on executive boards, even much lower. Why is that steep ramp up within these two years? And um, I have to mention a, a lady that um, Marie Claire already mentioned. It's uh, Simonetta Samaruga. Um, she, she is quite or was always a fighter for, let's say, a, a, regulation, a regulatory context, at least, or um, a, a little bit more than a recommendation, and she really came up with this 30% by 2030. And um, that's also Switzerland. When, when you see, oh, now it's required, then you're faster. So they, they re you reach it in two years, but you have whatever seven years left to do that. So that, that, that's one factor that is very important. And another one why I'm optimistic is this spring, um, spring last year, a lot of big corporates changed their statutes. They changed the statutes because they analyzed very much what are the legal requirements going on in the EU. And also what the um, Federal Council of Samaruga said, um, what comes for all the companies, not, all, not only the state-owned, and they anticipate that a little bit. And in the statutes, there, normally people don't read that, also shareholders not. But what is written in there is, you go for the will of the shareholder, dot, finished. And that's why it's so difficult to, to take this, this uh, stakeholder view in it. You can do it, let's say, um, in a narrative, but, it, but it's not written in the statutes. And they changed that, a, lo a lot of companies changed it. And they said the financial and the non-financial criteria are, no, are now equal, and all the shareholders can really directly ask for putting on the agenda non-financial topics. So this is basically the license to operate from the top to increase the numbers a little bit better than they are now. So that's why I'm quite optimistic. And I'm also optimistic because um, we have such, a, let's say, pool of tremendous women coming up from the high schools, not only this one, all, all over the country. Mm -hmm. And I think when, when there is a, a reg regulatory framework, yeah. together with really the, the resources that you have, I mean, and the Fachkräftemangel that you have, I mean, come on, this should work yeah. <laughs> in the next five years, not in the next 30 years. Marie Knell, you're, you're interacting with some of these, these people. Um, um, what, what's your sense of optimism? And, and indeed, how, how optimistic is, is the younger age group in general? Well, maybe like to go into the optimism question around the younger generation, there was a study which was really shocking that, I can't recall the exact numbers, but it was a, it was a big majority okay. which believes that, that there is no hopeful future. There's no hope for the future. There's no hopeful future. I think like it was, I mean, it, 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 was, oh a gran, it was a granular scale, but it was actually quite shocking. I think like every third young person in this study, and it was done across 11 countries or something. This was quite a big study. I don't want to like misquote anything right now, mm -hmm. but it was actually really shocking. But um, to go to the combined question, I think it's, it's the power of using this moment of desperation to change something, because I think that's, when actually change is happening. Because if you're all comfortable, you're not going to change anything. It's going to happen when, when we are in these moments of either being desperate, being frustrated, being angry, being sad, where actually like something I think really special emerges, which you then actually can, har can harvest and actually can drive forward. And maybe just to give an example, so when I was a negotiator um, in the negotiation team, and you know like you see the placard where it's for Switzerland written, but you see that I'm a little bit different. You see that I'm a little bit younger, I'm always wearing flowery dresses, as today, you know, and it's in a room with all the people who are wearing gray and black suits. So you see that I'm a little bit different, yet I was there as a representative, I've been negotiating already for a week. And there was an, an older gentleman from another European country, I can't recall which country, came over and said, like, I want to talk to the Swiss delegation. I was like, yeah, of course, let's have a conversation. I'm, I'm here. I was like, no, I would like to talk to the Swiss delegation. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's, that's me, right? So let's have a conversation. And then he clearly didn't get it, and then he walked away. 
It took me a couple of seconds to understand that he didn't believe that actually a young lady in a flowery dress with a laptop of a lot of stickers can actually negotiate for a country like Switzerland. <laughs> and it was really frustrating, got really angry in yeah. this moment, but also it was something emerging. It was like, I can never change this system alone by being an only, you know, there's only a young person in this room who actually has the mandate to negotiate. What is needed is a movement who then drives a change on the systemic level that we actually value the representation, the diversity of, and, 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 and really like having like more and more like young people and young females and I mean, just people of all kinds in these rooms mm. because only then we can actually change something. And I don't think if I would, if, I'm actually really grateful to this person that this person didn't trust in me because only then I actually came up with the idea of actually creating an academy, which is today the largest academy to train young negotiators and diplomats in the environmental space. And we work with every third country in the world. And we are four female co-founders from the Global South and the Global North. I don't like this division, but like really we, we are an inclusive team. We have, like, we have young people working, especially females, from all continents around the world. And within two years, we, bec we became something which the UN told us in the first meeting, I don't think you will ever succeed. And mm. we showed them we actually can. We convinced the countries and everyone that actually it's possible to bring young people to the table if we actually train them well. Yeah. And I don't know if I would have ever had this vision of what to do if this wouldn't have been this moment of desperation and frustration and a lot of anger towards this older gentleman who had all the privileges in life to just be there and tell me off that I probably cannot negotiate for a country like Switzerland. So maybe that's as a learning for us. How can we, how can we kind of, you know, use this frustration and anger in a positive sense and kind of turn this power around and actually make something which is unstoppable. I suspect a lot of us can actually relate to what you're saying on, on some level. And um, Mena, I'm coming to you now with this, this question about the, the AI-related future being rosy, or, or, or is it? Or how confident are you in, in its ability to actually drive this change that needs to happen? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a tough question, actually. Like, um, I'm as conf confident as we are willing to actually create movements and we are willing to, to make changes happen and be uncomfortable enough to actually do something about it. Because as I said, we just need to dream up that future and push for it and make it happen. And I think like, we need to also you know, push the people who are giving us these models to work with and like, who kind of take... Um, equality or like accessibility and, and equity as being just like a statistic. It has to just be around this and this percent because if you break down the statistics, then you will have very specific demographics like in computer vision models, black women are statistically very less uh, well represented and also kind of less recognizable and stuff like that. So just breaking it down and looking for our own angles and being able to communicate and being able to address that. And I think just having that awareness is something that makes me optimistic. Uh, looking at the diversity in our um, education system, like people com coming up uh, from high school, um, young bachelor master students, like all of that is mm. making me optimistic. And also uh, looking at how many campaigns are kind of launched to, to enable that, like to go into schools and to travel around the world and to talk about these issues and to stand here and like to address these things is also making me optimistic that we can actually work and achieve that. Because I believe like a lot of these aspects are things that we can create ourselves. Yeah, very good. Any, any final words? Oh, just yeah. like one sentence. There, there are some studies that change always takes longer to reach the tipping point, but then the change itself is like, you know, accelerating itself, and then it becomes implemented faster than we ever thought. And I think that's probably a good thought to keep in mind um, when we talk about, you know, all the desperate studies that we are just in this curve which goes slowly, slowly up to reach the tipping point. Mm. And we can all contribute every single day, and we actually have to, that actually we can accelerate this curve to reach the tipping point. For once, a good tipping point. Um, even faster. <laughs> Very good. I think we might just leave it at that, if, if that's okay. I think that's a good um, thought to finish on, um, because our time together is coming to a close. Um, that was a really fascinating journey. Um, that you all took us on. We, we had a very diverse group, and um, I thought a little bit about, you know, is this going to work, and are we going to be able to coalesce around a, a, a series of topic and, and bring our audience along uh, this journey with us? And I, I think we did. Um, some of the things that I made a note of which really stayed with me um, are this notion of being aware of who's not in the room. That was a point that particularly stood out. Um, 
that equality is not just a statistic, um, that you can empower anyone, and the question is, how, how do we actually do that? Um, that um, having impact and creating change um, takes people with courage, and, um, and it takes a set of role models to come and share their personal experiences and know-how um, with a group like us today to uh, inspire us to do um, whatever we can in our own stations um, to empower change. Um, I'd like to walk the talk and um, thank a few people um, because it really is um, uh, that when uh, we support each other and learn from each other that we can achieve great things. And um, this event was made possible by my colleague Alexandra who is uh, organizing the uh, Global Lecture Series. Um, Catherine, Mena, Marie-Claire, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to thank our audience for all of your questions and making this uh, a really interactive um, event. Uh, in spite of the beautiful weather outside, you were here, and I, I think that that helped us have a very good um, discussion. Um, I am told the next ETH Global Lecture is in the pipeline. Um, you'll hear about it uh, through the usual channels. I'm not at liberty to disclose the details at the moment. Um, let's um, continue our conversation at the Apero today. And with that, again, happy International Women's Day, and thank you very much. <laughs>